Hi, welcome to AP Calculus at East Aurora High School. Today we're going to review section 1.3. We're going to talk about the different ways of evaluating limits analytically. Another word for analytically would be algebraically. So, so far we've been looking at uh, evaluating limits using a table or a graph, and now we're going to look at this analytically. So our first step would be to always try direct substitution. When I'm given a function and I want to know what happens as the x value approaches a certain number, I want to know what function value does that then produce. So with direct substitution, let's look at example A, the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus 6 over x plus 2. Now I can just go ahead and do direct substitution on this, so I'm going to say substituting the 2 in for x, that's giving me 2 squared plus 6 over 2 plus 2. And just doing the calculations here, I'm getting of course 10 over 4, and I can reduce that to 5 halves. So what that tells me graphically is that as my x-coordinate is approaching 2 on the x-axis, my y, or my function value, is approaching 5 halves. This would be a point on my graph, 2 comma 5 halves. So I'm really just finding the y coordinate for that x value. Let's try a trigonometric one. So we've got the limit as x approaches pi of the sine of 2x plus 3 cosine x. So go ahead and substitute pi in. So I'm going to say this is going to be equal to the sine of 2 pi plus 3 times the cosine of pi. And yes, we do need to know our trig values. So we're going to say, of course, the sine of 2 pi, that's equal to 0. 3 times the cosine of pi, the cosine of pi is negative 1, so when I multiply by 3, I'm getting a negative 3 there. So adding those values together, I see that this function is approaching a y value of negative 3. And again, when I substituted pi in for x, I got the answer for this function. The function value is negative 3. So that really just tells me that on the graph, there's a point at pi comma negative 3. Now, sometimes we're going to take a look at functions that agree at all but one point. So here's an example of a piecewise function. I'd like to start with a graph of this function and see what happens when I graph it. So the equation for the piecewise function is f of x is equal to x squared plus x plus 1 as long as x does not equal 1. f of x is equal to 1 when x is equal to 1. So what I'd like you to do is take a few minutes, pause the video, and go ahead and fill out the table of values, especially looking around the number 1. I'm going to make my table of values so that it goes something like this. Negative 2, negative 1. I'm going to fill in another value at negative 1 half, and I think that'll be apparent in a few minutes why we're doing that. 0, 1, 2, and let's go up to the number 3. So go ahead and pause the video and fill out your table of values so that we can come back and graph this function that's a piecewise function. Welcome back. Compare your function values with mine. And now let's go ahead and plot these points. So again, pause the video for a minute, plot the points, but don't connect them yet. Now as I plotted these points, I saw that this was a quadratic function, graphing as a parabola. Now you'll notice though that there's one point, the point at the point 1 comma 1, that just doesn't fit the pattern. It doesn't follow what this function is doing. If I actually took the number 1 and substituted it into the equation, so 1 squared plus 1 plus 1, that actually gives me 3. Unfortunately, that's not a point on my graph. So at 1 comma 3, I'm going to put an open circle because it's an empty spot on my graph. Connecting these points, I'm going to get the quadratic parabola looking like this, going to that empty spot, and then continuing on up here to continue my parabola. You'll notice that the point right here, that point 1 comma 1, 
is not part of my graph. It's a discontinuity on my graph. So what I have done here is seen that I've got a function that at the number 1 has a hole in the parabola, but then has an extra point at 1, 1. Now what, did this, what is this going to mean for my limit? The limit really tells me what the graph or what the function is approaching as x is approaching 1. Well, as x is approaching 1, my function is actually approaching the number 3, even though I've got that separate point at 1, 1. We're going to talk quite a bit about this in the rest of the chapter. We're, of course, going to call this a discontinuity. But we're still going to say that the limit is equal to 3 because that's what the function value is approaching around the number x equals 1. So you've got to distinguish here between the answer for the limit and the answer for the function value. The function value answer is 1. The limit answer is 3. Now I've put a note in here and I want you to write this down and make sure that you do go to your textbook and look at this. Please see the strategies for finding limits on the bottom of page 79 in your textbook. Again, you were introduced to these strategies back in pre-calculus. This video is just meant to remind you about each of these strategies and when we're going to use them. So a technique that's going to be very common for us finding a limit will be to rewrite a function where I have two functions that agree at all but one point. Let's see where this method is going to be important. First of all, when I am finding a limit, first and foremost, I am going to try direct substitution. So let's go ahead and do a direct substitution into this limit. The limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus 2x minus 8 over x minus 2. So substituting 2 in for x, I'm getting 2 squared plus 2 times 2 is 4 minus 8 all over 2 minus 2. Now when I evaluate this, I see that my numerator gives me 0 and my denominator gives me 0. So when direct substitution produces this form 0 over 0, this has a special name. This is called the indeterminate form. So when direct substitution produces the form 0 over 0, that indeterminate form, what we're going to have to do is rewrite this limit. One method of rewriting this limit is either canceling or dividing out. In the first example, I'm going to go through the method of canceling. So let's go back to our limit, and we'll say the limit as x approaches 2. We see that x squared plus 2x minus 8 in the numerator is factorable. So when I factor this, I'm getting x plus 4 times x minus 2. I still have an x minus 2 in my denominator. So what's happening here is when I substitute 2 into this function, I see that I'm actually making a factor of 2 minus 2, or 0 over 0 in the numerator and denominator. This is what caused that indeterminate form. So what I can go ahead and do is cancel off that like factor in the numerator and denominator and go ahead and substitute 2 into what's left over. So this is going to be the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 4, which gives me an answer of 6. Now what this means is that I've rewritten this function. The function x squared plus 2x minus 8 over x minus 2 doesn't have an answer at x equals 2. But I can rewrite this in an equivalent form and the only place that these two functions are not equivalent is at the number 2. At the number 2 my original function, this one right here, didn't have an answer at 2. But my newly written function, the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 4, that's just a linear function. That does have an answer, and that's going to allow me to find the answer for the limit of the original.
Now let's go ahead and look at another limit. The limit as x approaches negative 1 of x cubed minus 3x squared plus x plus 5 over x plus 1. Again recalling, let's do that direct substitution first. So negative 1 cubed minus 3 times negative 1 squared, which is just 1, minus 1, because that's plus x, plus 5, all over negative 1 plus 1, if we carefully calculate that, we see again that we get this indeterminate form of 0 over 0. So we have to come up with a way of rewriting x cubed minus 3x squared plus x plus 5 divided by x plus 1. We want to write an equivalent function at all but one point. The one point where they won't match is at negative 1. Now, we don't easily see a factorization for x cubed minus 3x squared plus x plus 5, so another method would be to do a division. In pre-calculus and in Algebra 2, you've learned three different methods for division, and I'm going to go over all three of them. So first of all, some of you might recall the synthetic division method. So I'm going to go up a I'm going to go up above here where I've got more room, and I'm going to go ahead and do a synthetic division. Remember that we always take the coefficients of the, no of the polynomial that we are dividing. So I'm going to say 1x cubed, negative 3x squared, 1x, and 5. And I'm dividing by x plus 1. So remember, we take the opposite of that sign, and we put the negative 1 right there. So the first step for synthetic division is to carry down the 1, multiply negative 1 times 1, and that's giving me negative 1, and I fill that in right there, and go ahead and add those two terms together. Multiply again, and that's giving me a 4. Add together, and I get 5. 5 times negative 1 is negative 5. Add together, and I get 0. And remember, I put it in a box like that because that's my remainder. So what I've really done here is divided, and I ended up with 1x squared minus 4x plus 5. So I can rewrite this limit, and then I can say that this is now going to be the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x squared minus 4x plus 5. Go ahead and substitute in, so I'm getting 1 plus 4 plus 5. And the limit for this answer would be 10. The limit for this function would be 10. Now again, what I've done is rewritten this more complicated expression as a function that matches every single place except for at negative 1. Let's go ahead. If you don't remember synthetic division, another possibility would be to do long division. So I'm going to start with my x cubed minus 3x squared plus x plus 5. And I'm going to go ahead and divide by x plus 1. So again, this video is meant to be a refresher on some of the things that you learned in pre-calc. So x cubed divided by x, that's giving me x squared. So I go ahead and put that on top. x squared times x is x cubed. x squared times 1, positive x squared. Now here's where some people get a little mixed up. We've got to make sure that we subtract this time. So subtracting is giving me a negative 4x squared. This usually looks pretty familiar if I've done the synthetic. The numbers kind of match up. x uh, goes into negative 4x squared negative 4x times. Negative 4x times x is negative 4x squared. Negative 4x times 1 is negative 4x. Go ahead and subtract. And I see that I'm getting a 5x. Bring down the 5. How many times does x plus 1 go into 5x plus 5? That goes in evenly 5 times. A little messy writing for my division here. 5 times x plus 1 is 5x plus 5. Subtract, and I see that I get a remainder of 0. So once again, I get exactly the same polynomial function as I had over here, x squared minus 4x plus 5. Now, one more method that I know some of us teach in Algebra 2, uh, not necessary that you know it, but it is a, a cool method to do division. It was called the reverse tabular method. And for those of you that did learn it, you'll recall that what we did 
for a reverse tabular was put the x plus 1 in the front of a box. Now the box I've made two rows because I'm dividing by a polynomial that has two terms. I'm going to leave the box kind of an indefinite length and the first term of my divisor is the x cubed. So I'm going to say, okay, we're going to put the x cubed right here. What do I have to multiply by x to get x cubed? That's going to be x squared. Go ahead and multiply x squared times 1, and that gives me an x squared. Now my goal is to get this second term right here. So if I need a negative 3x squared, I've got an x squared, so what do I have to add to x squared to get negative 3x squared? I have to add negative 4x squared, so that goes right here. And again, you saw that number in the other two division uh, methods as well. Now go ahead and divide again. You're going to say, okay, what do I have to multiply x by? What should I put up here to get negative 4x squared? That would be a negative 4x. Negative 4x times 1 gives me negative 4x. But if I look carefully, I see that I need an x as my next term. So I need to put something right here in this box so that these two together add to be x. So I'm going to put a 5x there because when I combine those two terms, that gives me an x. What do I then need to multiply this x by to get 5x? That goes right here. That's nice and easy. That's going to be a 5. So 5 times x is 5x. 5x, or 5 times 1 is 5. That exactly matches that last term right there, so I know I'm done with my division. And again, I see that this polynomial up here matched what I had by either synthetic division or long division. Once I get that polynomial, that, that answer, that quotient, I'm going to then just use direct substitution to get the answer for my limit, which in this case is 10. So you can practice with any of those dividing techniques. My next method for solving for a limit is going to be the rationalizing technique. You should have also seen this method in pre-calculus. So let's go ahead and once again do our direct substitution. Direct substitution always happens first. So substituting a 1 in for x, I'm getting the square root of 1 plus 3 minus 2 divided by 1 minus 1. Well, the square root of 4 is 2. 2 minus 2 is 0. 1 minus 1 is also 0. So when I get this indeterminate form, that tells me I've got to have a way of rewriting this polynomial so that I can find a function that matches at all but one point. The one point where they're not going to match is at 1. This original function does not have an answer at 1. It's indeterminate. But I want to find a function that's going to match exactly for every other number except for at the number 1. Now, hopefully you recall the technique from pre-calc where we're going to rationalize. I know to use that method because I've got a radical. When I'm doing rationalization, I'm always going to multiply by the conjugate of the term that has the radical. So in this case, I'm going to multiply by the conjugate of the numerator. Usually this rationalizing technique is going to be rationalizing the numerator. So that means that I am going to multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate. So the conjugate is just the same two terms with the opposite sign in between. So that's going to be a square root of x plus 3 plus 2 in both the numerator and the denominator. Now remember what happens when you multiply conjugates together. This is really multiplying a sum and a difference of two terms. So when I multiply radical x plus 3 times radical x plus 3, that's just giving me x plus 3. The outers and the inners in my FOIL would end up canceling, so I really just have to multiply the last. Negative 2 times positive 2, that gives me a negative 4. Now I'm going to really advise you not to distribute this x minus 1, so I'm going to keep this in factored form in the denominator. So I'm going to say x minus 1 times the square root of x plus 3 plus 2. 
And you'll see why in a minute that in my numerator, this is going to be the limit as x approaches 1. In my numerator, I'm actually getting that factor of x minus 1. So that's going to allow me to cancel the x minus 1 that's in the denominator. And all that will be left in the denominator is that conjugate. So the square root of x plus 3 plus 2. So canceling these two off, that's going to leave me with a 1 in the numerator. Go ahead and do now a direct substitution. So I'll have 1 over the square root of 4, that's 2. 2 plus 2 gives me an answer for my limit, 1 fourth. So to sum it up here, what this means is my original function did not have a function value at x equals 1. So I couldn't evaluate the limit using that original. So instead, I did my rationalizing technique by multiplying by the conjugate of the numerator. Doing some cancellation cancels off where I'm getting the 0 in the numerator and denominator and gives me a function that matches the original in every single place except for at x equals 1. This one does have an answer at x equals 1, so I'm going to use it to find my limit. Now, take a few minutes and see if you can evaluate the next limit using this rationalizing technique. Come back and check your answer with mine. Welcome back. Check your work with mine. I started, of course, by trying a direct substitution with 0 for x, and I got the indeterminate form. That tells me to use one of my methods to rewrite my original, so I used the method of rationalizing the numerator. I multiplied by the conjugate of the numerator. That conjugate multiplication gave me this product right here. Notice that the 25s cancel each other out, so therefore I've got an x in the numerator and denominator that can be canceled. When I cancel those, I end up with this newly written function that matches my original at every place except at x equals 0. This new function does have an answer at x equals 0, and that answer, when I plug 0 in for x, gives me a limit of 1 tenth. So what that tells me is that my, as my function, as x approaches 0 for my function, the y value approaches 1 tenth. Let's review one more method today. This is called simplifying a complex fraction. Sometimes I'll have a limit that looks like the following. The limit as x approaches 1 of 2 over x plus 7 minus 1 fourth over x minus 1. Trying direct substitution first, of course, I'm getting 2 eighths minus 1 fourth. Uh-oh, those are equivalent to each other, so in my numerator I know I have 0. In the denominator, 1 minus 1 also gives me 0. So there's that indeterminate form that has been prevalent in all of our examples today. Now, you'll recall that uh, simplifying a complex fraction just means that I've got to rewrite this function by multiplying the numerator and the denominator by the least common denominator of all of my denominators. So I go off to the side and I say, okay, that least common denominator has to have an x plus 7 in it because I have a fraction with a denominator of x plus 7, but it also has to have a 4 because there's a fraction with a denominator of 4. In the bottom of this complex fraction, x and minus 1 just have denominators of 1, so I don't have to add anything else to my least common denominator. So I am going to take each part of this complex fraction and multiply by that least common denominator, hoping to cancel off anything that's making this problem more complicated. So let's multiply by 4 and by x plus 7 right here. 4 and x plus 7 right here, and this whole denominator gets multiplied by 4 and by x plus 7. Now do some cancellation, so the x plus 7's cancel. 2 times 4 gives me an 8. And I'm going to keep my limit here, of course, because that's the purpose of this whole problem. Now in the second fraction, I see the one I multiply, I'm going to cancel off the 4's. Watch out for that minus sign. So this is going to be a negative 1 times x, which is negative x, negative 1 times 7, which is negative 7. 
all over. And again, don't multiply this out because I'm hoping to do some cancellation of factors. Now, when I look at this, I see that uh, 8 minus x minus 7 is actually giving me the limit as x approaches 1 of 1 minus x in the numerator. In the denominator, 4 times x minus 1 times x plus 7. And I see I have opposites here. 1 minus x and x minus 1 are opposites of each other, so I can cancel opposites and keep a factor of negative 1. So this is going to be the same as the limit as x approaches 1 of negative 1 over 4 times x plus 7. Substituting that 1 in, I'm getting my limit to be negative 1 over 4 times negative 1 plus 7, oh, I'm sorry, positive 1 plus 7, 4 times 8, so my limit, negative 1 over 32. Now do me a favor and pause the video and try the last example on your own and then come back and check your answer with mine. Welcome back. Check your answer with mine. I got a final answer for my limit of 1 over 36. Again, doing direct substitution, produce the indeterminate form 0 over 0. My least common denominator was 6 times x plus 3, so I multiplied that. Now, don't forget to multiply it in the denominator as well. The biggest mistake students make is to sometimes forget to multiply in the denominator. In the case of the first fraction, the 6 is canceled. In the case of the second fraction, the x plus 3 is canceled. So when I uh, combined like terms in the numerator, I got x minus 3, which canceled with the factor of x minus 3 in the denominator. Uh, that produced the equivalent at all but one spot function 1 over 6 times x plus 3, and then substituting in a 3, I ended up with 1 over 36. Thanks very much for practicing evaluating limits analytically today, a review of section 1.3. We're going to be working a whole lot with these methods in class the next time, so make sure that you are very familiar with all of these methods. Have a great night and see you next time.